I'm Tanya Berger Wolf. I'm professor of computer science and engineering, electrical computer engineering, and evolution ecology and organismal biology at the Ohio State University, where I'm also director of the Translational Data Analytics Institute and uh, the Imageomics Institute. I'm also co founder and director of the AI for Wildlife Conservation nonprofit WildMe. Being a director of an institute means enabling other people's research. Being a director and co-founder of a nonprofit, meaning translating that research into something which is usable, actionable, and deployable in the real world, outside of the research world, right. to support biodiversity monitoring and uh, wildlife conservation. So AI for Wildlife Conservation is a translation of foundational research. Okay. Right. So uh, the research that we do is in AI for biology, mm -hmm. for a particular type of biology, ecology for the most part, okay. is that's where I start. That's the last 20 years, 20 plus years of my research. I've been a computational ecologist. So I'm a computer scientist that works with biologists, mainly ecologists, who are studying the, uh, the systems organisms in the context of their environment and evolution. Mm -hmm. I am on the computational side trying to devise methods, approaches, models, systems that not only bring in more data for scientists, but also make sense of that data. The Imageomics Institute, which is the whole new, starting a whole new field of science mm -hmm. that we call Imageomics, is an expression of that foundational research. Creating artificial intelligence solutions to extract biologically meaningful information directly from images. Mm -hmm. Like genomics before, which extracts biological information from sequences using quantitative approaches, imageomics is extracting biological information from images, such as biological traits, phenotypes, being able to go beyond the, oh, this image is, this picture is of this bird, but saying it's pic this picture of this bird because it has a yellow belly, black behind the beak, and it wobbles when it walks. That's the foundational research that goes into uh, the, the type of research that we do. Here are all the animals in this picture. This is their species. And among those three zebras, this is Zippy the zebra, Zoe the zebra, and Zach the zebra, and then Using that information to help conservation, that's the, the, the translational aspect of it. We were happy with ourselves when we did this uh, in 2011. Two months later, we had 70, 70 species requests. Can you do it for my species? Can you identify uh, anim uh, individual animals from my species? Everything from Hawaiian snails to humpback whales. Like, oh my God, I didn't realize it could be that useful because the, 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 you know, we started with a very practical question of how do you identify individual animals, but it required computational research to provide an answer to that question. The fact that it ended up being useful pointed out at a huge gap that already exists in biodiversity monitoring and conservation is the lack of data. So not only that ability to identify individual animals was important, and we could, thinking about why it's important, why did we have all of this interest? The gap that is there, the need that is there, we, can, we could then actually think intentionally, how would we address this problem? How would we fill this gap? How would we uh, provide the solutions that conservation managers uh, and, and wildlife biologists actually need. We hear reports that we're losing biodiversity at an unprecedented rate. Uh, UN used to put them every two years, now it's every year. And actually we, we hear uh, terms like the sixth mass extinction and, and other dire warnings about the state of biodiversity of the world. In addition to these real pressing problems of loss of biodiversity, biodiversity monitoring also has a data problem. We don't know how much we're actually losing and how fast. 
iconic species like killer whales or polar bears, we don't have enough information quite often to even tell how many of what's the population size, right. where are they, how do we assess policies that we put in place to protect the species, is it working, are we wasting our resources, can we be doing something else, should we be doing this for every other species, we have no idea. So to address this data problem that biodiversity has, we need to find both new sources of data and accelerate access to the sources of data that we already have and traditionally are used. So how do we scale what we have and how do we increase the resolution across time, space and individuals with additional, potentially additional data sources? That was the problem that we set out to address. What we realized is the most abundant and readily available source of information of pretty much anything out there today are images. So if we can leverage all the existing images about animals, plus the images that scientists already are collecting and incentivize additional image collection and contribution to conservation, through making it actionable, through making images of animals actually usable directly in conservation and biodiversity monitoring, but tr by translating them into something that can uh, go from a picture to population size estimate, from a picture to trajectory estimate, things like that. And to us, the way to do it was to be able to identify an individual animal, because then you can track animals, you can count them, you can produce that population size estimate, it also has the added benefit of really lowering the barrier for entry for data contribution and participation mm -hmm. because all you have to do is a three-year-old can take a picture of, right. a, of, a, of a whale, right? Which, which increases participation. And by uh, the ability to identify an individual whale or zebra or, or, or Hawaiian snail, brings the story of that animal, right? makes it personal, makes it relatable, it encourages people's participation. Whale sharks, which are the largest fish on Earth, prior to 2016, their conservation status was vulnerable and the population trend was considered to be stable. Since the establishment of Wild Book for Whale Sharks, we've had enough data contributed and sufficiently many individual sh sharks identified that the Species Commission for Whale Sharks, for IUCN Red List, the experts on whale sharks for conservation, mm -hmm. were able to use that data to decide that the conservation status of the species is actually endangered and the population trend is declining. That's a huge change. That means different resources, different protection uh, guidelines, different policies, international and local, that immediately kick into effect because the status has changed. Science is not the should not be the privilege of the few who happen to go through the process of getting a PhD and then a position that allows us to do research um, at, uh, at, at, that, that is supported by funding that comes actually from everyone in this country. The curiosity that starts in a child should be continually encouraged and enabled. We are a curious species. We're, we're, we're curious by nature, literally. Any way that we can continue to, to, to foster that curiosity and engage everybody in the process of understanding the world around us should be embraced. The excitement that every one of us feels in the discovery, in, in, uh, that when we get this little bit of understanding of, oh, this is how the world works, this is why. This should be shared. 